as you know, I'm doing a series on life in the spirit. And the Christian life is a spiritual life. God has created us to be spiritual people. We are spirit beings. We have a soul. We live in a body. We have physical experiences. We have emotional experiences. But our core personality is the spirit. And it's always important for us to understand that. So today I'm doing part four of life in the spirit. Life in the Spirit, part four. My subtitle is The Condition of the Human Spirit. The Condition of the Human Spirit. Now, I have taught that the human spirit is not the same as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God. The human spirit is the Spirit of man. The two are not the same. And so today we're going to look primarily at two, three main conditions of the spirit of man. And, uh, and then I will pick it up uh, from next week again uh, in, in the direction I should be going. Uh, but we will go to the book of Genesis uh, chapter 2 and verse 16 and 17. After God had created his image, whom I call the spirit man, he clothed the man in a body made from the earth and breathed into that body made from the earth the breath of life and man became a living soul. So his image, he's a living soul and he is a body. And God speaks to this totality of a man in Genesis chapter 2 verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. In the day that you eat on, of it is a Hebrew expression uh, that is equivalent to when you do it, when you eat of this fruit. It doesn't mean that particular day but when you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. In the Hebrew, the word surely die, uh, or the phrase would sound something like, in dying, you will die. In dying, you will die. So it's not just talking about something that happens instantly and ends, but it's a process. In dying, you will die. In dying, you will die. So God is saying, the day you disobey my instruction and eat of this fruit, something will start in you that is death. And it will be a process and continually end in a final death sometime. So in dying, you will die. You will die as a process. Well, you and I know that Adam and Eve um, ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, but they didn't seem to have died. They didn't seem to have died. As a matter of fact, the passage says that their eyes were open. So there, there is a death that you die and your eyes are still open. So their eyes were open, uh, but the, the Lord said they will surely die. Well, the, the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sin. So when Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Romans tells us two things happened. First, sin came and with the sin came death. So we can conclude that the spirit of man was infected with sin and death. The spirit of man was infected with sin and death. Immediately they seemed to be alive but sin and death had started a process that separated them from God and they 
condition of the image of God, the, the condition of the spirit of, of man changed right after that. Right after that, the condition of the spirit of man changed. The spirit of man was not killed, but the spirit of man changed its condition. And we're going to talk about the three conditions the spirit of man can be in. The three conditions the spirit of man can be in. And uh, I will zero in on the last condition, and that's what I'll be focusing my teaching on uh, from next week. Uh, but the spirit of man can be in three different conditions. The first one is the spirit of man can be separated from God. Separated from God. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18 this I say therefore and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. I want you to know that phrase carefully. Alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. After Adam and Eve had eating uh, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, sin came and with death. What did it all mean when it says sin came and in death uh, and death? It simply means that man, the spirit of man was separated from God. The spirit of man separated from God. God is the source of life. And when you are disconnected from him, you lose life. So, you're still alive, but you're not connected to life. You are separated from God. It's, it's like uh, you have a, a metal, a metal piece, uh, um, a metal, and, and, and there is fire. And you put the metal in fire. Pretty soon, the metal becomes hot. And if, if the, the, the fire is very hot, Pretty soon the metal itself, iron, uh, will become reddish like the fire. Now when you take the iron from the fire, it will still be hot. It will still be hot. In fact, immediately you take it from the fire, it will still be red hot. But after some time, it will be hot. And over time, in dying, it will die. It will become totally cold because over time, because it is separated from the source of its heat, it will lose its fire. And that's what happened to the spirit of man. Separated from God and over time, totally dead unto God. It doesn't mean the spirit is dead. The spirit is alive, but the spirit is disconnected from the source of life. That is the state of Every human being born on this earth. Every human being is born with a spirit. But it's a spirit that is disconnected from God. It's a spirit alright. Moves in the spirit. Has the capabilities of a spirit. But disconnected from life. From God. And when the spirit is separated from God. Two things highlight its activities. First, it is ignorant of God. The spirit that is separated from God is ignorant from God. Paul says that the understanding is darkened. It has understanding, but it's a darkened understanding. It's a form of religion, but it is a darkened religion. It's like a person trying to look for somebody in the dark. It's making effort, but it's all guesswork, trying to test. Is this it? Is that it? Is that it? That's what it means when the spirit of man is separated from God. We make an attempt to find God, but it's all guesswork. Is that it? Is that it? And trying our best to locate God in the darkness. It, the separation of the spirit of man creates the ignorance towards God. And all religions in essence, are like that. There are men groping in the dark, trying to find God. So that's the first thing, ignorance of God. The second is that the spirit of man that is separated from God is a partaker of both good 
and evil. And this is so important. That's what God said after Adam and Eve had sinned. Partakers of good, both good and evil. That means they can live very sinful lives and still do very good things. The spirit that is separated from God is a contradiction. It's capable of achieving magnificent things. Magnificent good things. Can receive brilliant moments of inspiration and do brilliant things. And we can all look at it and say, wow, human, the human spirit is wonderful. At the same time, that spirit can come out with the most destructive ideas. So the spirit that is separated from God, capable of doing good and evil. So sometimes you can find people who are unbelievers and they can do brilliant things. But at the same time, that brilliant thing can also be very evil. It's a combination. So sometimes in the arts, in music, in drama, in fashion, you find people, brilliant creation, but their values are also brilliantly evil. That's the human spirit. Why is it able doing that? Because it is separated from God, it is not able to discern the source of what it is getting. So it can get an idea from Satan and think it's brilliant. Once in a while, it catches an idea from God and thinks it's brilliant, but it's not able to make a judgment as to which is right and which is wrong. All it is doing is channeling the capacity of the spirit. And we have a lot of people who are doing that. They are brilliant. They are, their minds, I mean, the things they come up with, we all watch it and say, wow, how could a human being do that? And we see all of them in inventions and in great inventions. But at the same time, you look at them and their values are so evil and wrong and detached from God. That is the man, the spirit man that is separated from God. It's ignorant towards God. It has the capacity to do both good and evil, sometimes in equal measure. And that's why sometimes, you know, uh, you know, there are people we admire because of their creativity, because of brilliant ideas they have in economics or brilliant ideas they have in fashion or brilliant ideas they have politically or books they've written. We, we admire them. But you listen to them and the things they stand for and you say, how can this brilliant man stand for this at the same time? Because the spirit of man separated from God is ignorant of God and is capable in equal measure of both good and evil. That is the state of every human being born into this world until they find Christ. Their spirits are separated from God. It doesn't mean that they, they don't have a spirit or their spirit has been killed. No. It doesn't mean they cannot do great things. No. It doesn't mean they will not be brilliant. They will, no. In fact, if you read uh, the book of Genesis, you, you'll find that the most brilliant people in the early history of the human race were the descendants of Cain. The descendants of Cain were the most brilliant. They were inventing all the things, but they were the most evil at the same time. <laughs> Contradiction in terms. And, and so you have to be careful just following brilliance. If you say, for me, all the thing I want is people who are brilliant, who are sharp, and people who are creative, it's good. But if you're not careful, you'll be following the wrong way. Because the spirit of man, detached from God, is capable of brilliance and creativity. Because it is still a spirit, although separated from God. So that's the first condition a human spirit can be in. Every human being is born to this condition. The second one, that one is a bit more dangerous. That is when the human spirit is united with Satan. So at this time, the human spirit that is separated from God is neither united to Satan or united to God. It's just an independent spirit. But the human spirit can also be sold to the devil. It can be united 
to Satan. And when it gets there, it's a dangerous place. I must say that only a few people on earth get to this point. Only a few people. It's not a common thing, but it does happen. And I will show you. This was the state of man before the flood. In Genesis chapter 6 verse 5. It says, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Do, do you know that? It's not that they are just bad people, you know, like when, when we all know bad people when we went to school. Some of you were bad people. Some of you knew bad people, you know. And, and they break school rules and they go and steal uh, the chicken from the house master and, you know, uh, and, and things like that. I mean, we all call them, we say, oh, there's a bad boy, bad girl and all of that. They run to town and do bad things. That's not what we are talking about. What the Bible is talking about is when every intent is evil. It means that this person has no capacity to do good. Every intent is evil and it is evil continually. Such people are not just spirits separated from God, but spirits separated from God, but now united with Satan. And that is why God had no other recourse but to wipe everybody out because they had no capacity to be good. They, they, why? Because the human spirit had now chosen. We are aligned with Satan. Don't be afraid. You are not there yet. You're not there yet. Because if you were there, you won't be in church. If you are there, you, you, you won't be in church. You won't even think God. You won't even think, let me go to church. Because at that time, your, your mind, your spirit, every intent is continuously evil. No pause. Only a few people get there. Only a few people. And this is not the same as being demon possessed. I will deal with that later on. This is not the same. This is a totally different level of evil. People who are united with the devil. And the first thing is that they are totally evil. Totally giving to evil. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? It's not like he did bad and changed. It's not that the person did bad and the last minute he says, oh, I'm so sorry for all the bad I've done. No. Totally and continuously there's no redemption because they can't even do good. That's why God destroyed people with a flood because they couldn't repent. They didn't have the capacity to repent because they were joined with Satan. Can people get there? Yes, they can get there. I will show you one person who got there because people who are joined with Satan partake of Satan's nature. And I will show you one person who got there. You know him very well. He's called Judas. That's where he got to. John chapter 13, verse 26 to 27. Jesus answered, It is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. And Jesus said to him, What you do, do quickly. I want you to note the phrase, Satan entered him. He didn't just talk to him. All of us, when, when we are tempted, we hear a voice, do it, don't do it, do it, don't do it. Drink it, don't drink it. Chase it, don't chase it. You know, I mean, it's a thought. Our minds, Satan hasn't entered you. But thoughts are coming to you. And most of the time, it's not even Satan. Because Satan cannot be in two places at the same time. Satan is finite. He's not infinite like God. God can be everywhere at the same time. Satan cannot be everywhere at the same time. So he cannot tempt two people at the same time. 
he, look, he focuses his attention once, one person at a time. Most of the temptations you have is demons suggesting thoughts to you. But this one is the big man himself dealing with Satan because Jesus is involved and the Bible says Satan entered him. Entered him. Didn't just speak to him but entered him. Because earlier if you, if you read the same uh, book of John chapter 13 uh, verse 2 it says, and supper being ended, supper being ended, the devil having already put it into the heart of Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So at this time, Satan has not entered him. He's put a thought in his mind. Betray Jesus. Betray Jesus. He's disgraced you. And, there, and this happened when uh, they were in the house of uh, Mary. Mary made her nice offering, opened the fragrance, and Judah said, hey, sir, we should have sold this fragrance for a lot of money and give it to the poor. And Jesus said, shut up, Judas, shut up. And he said it publicly, and Judas was so embarrassed. And from that time, Satan said, betray him. Betray him. He's disgraced you. You have to destroy him. You have to, you have to get rid of him. He's messed you up. He's destroyed you. So, but that's a thought. And Jesus is still working with, Jesus, uh, with Judas. And uh, they sit at the Lord's Supper. Jesus washes the feet of Judas. You know, by this time you say, Judas, you say, oh, yeah, no, I should repent. No, he doesn't repent. Jesus says, somebody will betray me. And Judas knows I am the one. And Jesus is the one I give this bread to. He is the one. Judas said, okay, let's see. Jesus dips the bread into the stew, gives it to Judas. He knows. Jesus knows. And he takes the bread and eats it. This is not a normal temptation. At this point, Satan himself, not a demon, not assistant demon, not assistant Lucifer, the big man himself entered Judas. And Judas became personified. Satan personified on earth. If you were looking for Satan on the earth at that time, he's in Judas. That's, that's what it means. That's what it means. It's a very serious thing. That's why I said not everybody gets there. Once in a while, people get there. But only a few people get to this state. Only a few people get to this state. If you read the Bible, Jesus had described Judas in John chapter 17, verse 12, when he is praying, uh, and he's praying to the Father, John chapter 17, verse 12, while I was with them in the Lord, in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me, I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled. He called the one who would betray him the son of perdition. Perdition means destruction. The son of destruction. Wow. Satan is going to use somebody and by the time he uses the person, the person will be called son of perdition. That phrase is used only twice. In the New Testament, only twice to describe two different people. Number one is Judas. Look at the second person who is also described the son of perdition. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3 to 5. It's talking about the end times. And it said, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come to pass unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of Perdition. Now, who is he talking about? The one that Christians popularly call the Antichrist. The Antichrist is described son of perdition. Judas is described son of perdition. Only two people who carry that title. And why? Because both of them are totally united to Satan. If you want to look for Satan on earth, is Judas. After Judas, he's looking for somebody else. 
and it will be the Antichrist. In between, there are people whom I believe have become sons of perdition. I believe somebody like Adolf Hitler was a son of perdition. I believe Satan entered him. Because there are certain levels of evil that a person cannot achieve except Satan enters him. And I believe that many people at various points in human history, Satan has entered them. They are united with Satan. These are not just demon-possessed people. They are not demon-possessed. They are Satan-possessed. There's a difference between demon possession and Satan possession. And if I have time, I will explain what demon possession is all about. Can a believer become a son of perdition? I don't think so. Can you, an ordinary looking you watching me today, become a son of perdition? I don't believe so. But it could happen. And if it happens, we won't see you in church. You'll be so evil and do so much evil that the world will know you. you because sons of perdition, they are in a different class by themselves. So that's the second state of the human spirit. The human spirit, separated from God, can also be united with Satan. And may the Lord never take us to that point. Amen. Third state, which is the good one. The human spirit, separated from God, can be united with Christ. That is the state of the believer, united with Christ. John chapter 17, verse 20 to 21. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So when a person gets born again, not only is their spirit a new spirit, but their spirit is joined to Christ. If you are a born again Christian, you don't just have a spirit, your spirit in you, but within your spirit, there is a new marriage that has taken place. Your spirit is joined to the spirit of Christ. And that is why Jesus says, when my spirit is joined from in you, nothing can separate that marriage. Nothing. Because your spirit is joined with Christ. Being born again is not just about going to church. It is becoming joined with Christ. You are fused in him. You are his. You are his property. The person that is joined with Christ doesn't just have a human spirit. But his human spirit is now the home of the Holy Spirit. The same spirit of God now lives in your spirit. Not in your body, not in your soul, but in your spirit. Your body will need to be subjected to your mind, your soul. Your soul needs to be renewed after the nature of your spirit so that you have a new spirit, the Holy Spirit, a renewed mind, and a body that is serving a mind that is under the control of the Holy Spirit. That is where God wants to take the believer. But it doesn't happen instantly. It doesn't happen instantly. That is why a believer can sin. But when a believer sins, something happens. You see, the, 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 the first state when your spirit is separated from God, when you sin, you like it. You like it. But when your spirit is joined to Christ, when you sin, you feel condemned. You feel bad. It, even though you may not tell everybody you feel bad, you know deep inside of you, 
you, there is a battle going on because what is inside you hates what your body is doing and that fight is constant. And Paul talks about it, the fight between the flesh and the spirit because your spirit will not let you go. And when you are a believer, your spirit will never let you go. Even when you haven't attended church for a long time, you've turned away from God, your spirit will not leave you alone. Because Christ lives in your spirit. And when he comes to live inside of us, a couple of things happen. First, we become alive unto God. The spirit that is joined with, united with Christ is alive. The spirit separated from God is dead unto God. But your spirit is alive unto God. Alive, open to the things of God. If you've been born again, one of the first things every believer experiences, it's almost like the day you got born again, you wonder, where have I been all this time? Why didn't I have this experience earlier? Why, why? It's, it's like something just fell from your eyes. Your eyes were open, not in the Adamic way, but in the Christian way. Your eyes were properly open. And not only that, you partake of God's divine nature. The spirit that is separated from God partakes of good and evil. The spirit that is united with Christ partakes of Satan's nature. The spirit that is united with Satan partakes of Satan's nature. The spirit that is united with Christ partakes of Christ's nature. If you are a born again Christian, the Holy Spirit doesn't live outside of you now. He lives inside in your spirit. What is the difference between the born again Christian and Adam? Adam had a spirit in Eden that was alive unto God. But God's spirit did not live inside of him. He had a human spirit alive to God. Because the passage of the Bible tells us God will visit Adam. God will visit him. God will visit him. God had to go to him and talk with him. God was not in him. So when we get born again, something better and greater than Eden happens to us. God does not just come to visit us. He makes his abode in us. But he doesn't live in our soul. He doesn't live in our bodies. He lives in our spirit. The challenge of the Christian is how do I get this Holy Spirit who lives in my spirit to control my mind and my actions? And that's what we will be dealing with in the subsequent lessons. <laughs>